Hey guys, I don't, I don't remember if I said this in the video, so I just wanna make sure I capture this for you guys uh, that didn't come on the trip. So over here is Ash Avenue. Okay, so we still have relatively high tide, so we can see all of our all of the uh, tidal inundation there. Here, we're on this levee. This right here is Franklin Creek, right here in this body of water right here. So you can see that the levee is highest right here because we're trying to shield the, the houses and stuff that side, and the levee is nowhere near as high on that side. Okay, this over here is, and you can see the, the car driving over there. So between that road and, and the creek, that is our Basin 1 area. That's our, the Basin 1 region. And that was the restoration that was done in the <clears throat> early 2000s um, to work on the hydrology here and, and work on the, the uh, banks, etc. cetera. Um, but you can see this is much more a flat planar area, a flat um, uh, marsh plain, not as innervated with tidal creeks, like ma main channel kind of thing kind of situation. So again, uh, Ash Avenue, Franklin Creek, Basin 1. And Basin 2 is just on the other side where that car is driving. And 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 obviously this is looking westward. That's the main salt marsh, main Carpentria salt marsh out that away. Okay, so here we're on the on the edge, or actually we're almost over Franklin Creek right here. And we're gonna talk about, and so over here is is the Basin One site. So, um, okay, so, all right, you guys, so I'm gonna step off if you guys wanna spread out on the, and you might have a better view over there if you guys spread out on the, um, spread out on the, on the bridge. Okay, so, so I just wanted to say, I wanna talk a little bit about the hydrology here. So we had a couple questions. Um, actually, let me put this over here, maybe like that. Is this better? I don't know, we'll, we'll try here. Okay, so um, so we're on the levee here, right? So one of the questions we just had when we're walking over was, you know, how, we talked about natural levying, right? If this, this is obviously a human constructed thing. If we look, we can see there's all kinds of evidence. There's uh, gravel and compacted dirt, etc. cetera. Um, we wanna control flood floodwaters there's two things we can use a flood wall or a levee a levee is just a mound of substance usually dirt in theory a, a levee could be out of concrete and other things but basically levee is a natural mound but if you guys look at it where you guys are you guys are standing on the on the apex of this there, there's a broad you know there's a broad cusp on either side so by definition the way it works engineering wise is if we're going to have um, you know, if we're going to have this height, we have to have to have the dirt extend a certain area that way and this way. If you're really, really constrained, and this is typically in an urban area like New Orleans or something, you could actually come in and put, it's highly artificial, it's highly constructed, but, but you know, sort of um, metal, metal planes basically down into the soil. And if you design it right, the idea is you still get the containment of the water, but you don't have to spread as far out. Those are not as structural, those, those are much more likely to fail, i.e. Hurricane Katrina and things like that. But but you do have some options if you're working on a levee, right? So, or if you're working on const constraining the, the river. So the other question we had when we were walking over was how high would this be? And right now we look to be, I don't know what you guys think, we're about 15 feet or so, maybe 20 feet above the, the edge of the channel, something like that, on that order of magnitude. The height of a natural levee like this would probably be more like, five feet above right something like that so this is this is much much higher than we would than we would naturally get by just de uh, a natural deposition of sediments etc um and what was the other oh then okay then the other question we have when we're walking back was so check it out so right over there here's part of the same tidal channel or excuse me the same uh creek right look i see a sycamore i see it looks like a cypress there's a bunch of trees there right what the hell look right here Right here we're walking, I don't see any trees. What's going on? So uh, it's, you might think it's a salt marsh, so we have salt and the salt's bad for trees. Maybe, but not really, because this is mostly fresh, right? A little bit, but this is mostly fresh. So partly is that, but the other part is that trees have been cut down on here. Trees will not be allowed to grow here. Why? Because this is a flood control structure. So engineers, historically don't like things with big root balls 
because they believe. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's there's some there's some truth to it, but I would argue that there's there's other things to think about as well. So they would argue here. I'm a tree. I'm I'm anchored in this in this levee, and my roots are going down into the dirt. If I get a failure, if we have a big storm or something like that blows me over, I'm like, oh, 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 and I fall over, I, my root ball would tear up. And so the reason they don't like big trees on levees is because the fear that if it were to fall over, it could catastrophically compromise the structural integrity of the, of the um, levee. It's the same reason why we've historically had tons and tons and tons and tons of rat poison around all these systems. Because for the same thing, they say, oh, ground squirrel, lots of ground squirrels here. Oh, the ground squirrel is going to come. The ground squirrel is going to burrow in and, the, and it's going to weaken the, the matrix of the levee. It's going to make it more likely to fail, right? So theoretically, I suppose that's true. I'm not trying to be dismissive of the concern. But at some point, we have to say, so is this an ecosystem or no, right? And so it, it, it's not as if we should have trees every single square foot, but I would argue, I don't know if we have to always have no trees on these systems, right? If we had a school over here, if we had the power station over here, I think that's a reasonable thing. If this fails right now, is it really gonna threaten that much stuff? Couldn't we come in and do an emergency fill? I think maybe. But we, we develop a lot of these rules for managing hydrology in systems that are not Southern California, that are not a Mediterranean ecosystem. And so the guidance that we use was developed in the East Coast. The guidance that we use was developed in the Gulf Coast or something, right? And, and so maybe it was appropriate for those sites, maybe not, but we oftentimes just import those rules to these settings. We should make sure that whatever the guidance is for plants, for structure, whatever, in our restoration is appropriate for that restoration environment for that context. And, and too often we just sort of willy nilly like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that because that's what people always do. The people that are designing this, and they're not bad people, I'm not trying to say engineers are evil. <laughs> don't mean that. Don't, if anybody watches this, don't say I said that. Um, but they historically don't have as much ecosystem concern or, or, or sustainability concerns as maybe we have. And so the goal there is not to say these guys are stupid, they shouldn't do that. The goal is to interact with those folks and point out, hey, is it possible for us to adjust the design so you still get your safety standards, whatever, done, but we maybe also introduce some more vegetation, or we also introduce some more wildlife, or we also introduce some more whatever. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. How bad do the storms and the weather affect this specific um, area? Because Southern California, it's not so drastic. So great question. So uh, in general, I would say, yeah, so it's, we're not like, we're not as bad as New Orleans is, let's say. Yeah. But um, it's real important for us when we talk about our restoration designs, all everybody understand, we cannot use, it, it, it's a, how do I say this? It's a huge danger to use our experience with the past climactic conditions as the guide for what's coming. In general, we're getting wetter wets and drier dries. So I don't like the term global warming. I like the term global weirding because that's a much better descriptor. descriptor. Things are just, it, it, the magnitudes are getting greater and the variation is getting greater. Whether we're talking about Australia, whether we're talking about the Sierras, whether we're talking wherever. And so, um, so, but historically speaking, historically speaking, did we have a lot of huge El Nino storms? We have an El Nino storm historically on average every seven to 11 years kind of thing. And that can be a problem in those years. But why was this so high? Remember, this was, this was first put in back when uh, that was, the mouth was sort of silting in and we had more entrainment. So if we did have water coming down, it's gonna be harder to get it squirt out of the mouth. And so it's gonna be more impoundment. So as we make the mouth more open, et cetera. And if you guys look, as you walk past here, there's a new permit, a new proposal to do essentially that, to, do, so, so to remove some of the silt and sediment in the channels here to, to have better, better flow out. If we have better flow out, you wouldn't need as, as high a, a berm. So the question is, do we still need a berm this high today? I, I don't think so. But I wouldn't necessarily, you know, if I said, oh, historically it was like five feet over, I, also wouldn't go to the five foot thing because we, we may well have some of these, we will have some of these crazy pulses. And so the question is, are we designing the system to, 
to be, uh, you know, the Oaks or the Galleria or whatever parking lot, right? Nobody ever uses all the parking lots in the malls ever, except for the two weeks before Christmas. So all of those mall parking lots, every 100% or the vast majority of them, I should say, are designed for that two week period. The whole rest of the year, all that asphalt, all that urban heat island, all that impervious surface, all that. Really? Is it really worth it so that we can have shop for two weeks? Right? So, so in some cases, maybe. maybe. Maybe this mall is the huge tax revenue for the city. And if they don't get that, you know, so I don't want to prejudge, but, but I'm just saying there's been a lot of assumptions made where we, where we sort of design for the worst possible case scenario. And, and there's nothing wrong with designing for the worst case scenario, but we have to talk about in a context like restoration, yes, we wanna worry about that, that once a year or that once every couple of years, but we also need to worry about the other 11 months of the year, right? And so, so nothing is gonna be perfect. We cannot make a perfect system that will solve every single whim and whatever. But we wanna have something that would be able to adapt when we have these stressors, it'll be able to bounce back quickly. And sometimes when we put a giant Walmart parking lot in there, that makes it harder for the system to adapt, harder for that system to respond, harder for that system to, to you know, redistribute sediments, energy, that kind of stuff. Cool? Other questions? Okay, so I know people are getting on. We're getting on to about hour two here. So, uh, so I think we'll just do a quick...